नमो दस भगवथो अर्हथो समुद नमो दस भगवथो अर्हथो समुद नमो दस भगवथो अर्हथो समुद बुधम सरण गचा तम सरण गचा संघम सरण गचा तुतय विबुध सरण गचा तुतय विधम सरण गचा तुतय विसंघम सरण गचा तथय विबुध सरण गचा तथय विधम सरण गचा तथय विसंघम सरण गचा नमो बुधय नमो धर्मय नमो संघय नमो बुधय नमो धर्मय नमो संघय नमो बुधय नमो धर्मय नमो संघय आई टेक रेफ्यूज अंटिल आई एम इनलाइटेंड इन द बुद्ध द धर्म एंड द संघ through the positive potential that create by practicing the six parameters may i soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings i take refuge until i am enlightened in the buddha the dharma and the sangha through the positive potential that create by practicing the six parameters may i soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May they be free from suffering and its causes. May they never be parted from their happiness beyond suffering. May they abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment to the near, and aversion from the far. I shall cause this great compassionate Buddha. Please inspire me to be able to do so. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind, and present clouds of every types of offerings, actual and mentally transformed. I confess all of my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time, and rejoice in all the virtues of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until cyclic existence ends and turn the wheel of dharma for all sentient beings. I dedicate the virtues of myself and others to the great enlightenment. However innumerable all sentient beings are, I vow to save them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme. So now get yourself in a comfortable spot for meditation. Meditation is very, very important. Obviously, living morally is also important. Um, meditation, all of the realizations, that we, all the levels of realization that we may have on the Dharma path towards enlightenment are gathered in meditation or realized in meditation. So getting yourself used to meditating often um, with good, um, good understanding of the methods to be used as well as good implementation of the methods. It's very important. 
So now you can gently close your eyes. Your lips are gently touching with your tongue resting on the upper palate of the mouth above the top teeth. The shoulders not rigid, but also not slouching forward, middle path. And now bring your mind initially to your body to release any tension from the body, which will help you to release the tension in the mind. So to your feet, release the tension from your toes, the balls of the feet, the arches of the feet and the heels. From the top of the feet, around your ankles, your Achilles tendons, and from your lower leg, the calf muscles and the shin areas. From around your knees, the front sides and the back of your knees, and your upper leg, the quad muscles at the front and the hamstrings at the back. Now focus on releasing any tension from the midsection of the body, from your hip flexor muscles, the groin and the glute muscles. From your lower stomach, on and above your hips and your lower back. Further up your stomach, up your sides and to the center of your back. From your chest area, underneath your arms and your upper back on the outsides of your back on either side or both sides, uh, other lateral muscles release from them and also release from the rhomboid muscles that are in between the shoulder blades and the spine on each side. Now bring your focus to release the tension from your upper trap muscles that run between your neck and shoulders, as well as your shoulders. your upper arms, the biceps and triceps. Elbows, forearms, wrists, hands, fingers and thumbs. And now bring your focus up to your neck and release any tension from the front sides and back of your neck. Up the back of your head and the sides of your head around your ears and temples. And from your face, around your cheekbones, the cheeks, make sure you're not clenching your jaw, your chin and your mouth, nose, sinuses, eye sockets and eyes. And your forehead as well, make sure you're not frowning. And finally, release any tension from the crown of your head. Now, just briefly scan your whole body just to see if you can release any more tension. And when you are ready, initially bring your focus to the tip of your nose. And the object of the meditation is the breath, the feeling of the breath as you breathe in and out. As you breathe in, the air is quite cool on the back of your throat. As your lungs fill with air, they expand. And as you breathe out, they compress. And the air is quite warm as it passes your throat on the way out your nose. If thoughts arise, don't cling to them. Don't grasp at them. Also, don't try to forcefully push them away or deny them. Just refocus on your breath if they arise. Let them come and go naturally by refocusing on your breath. And it is likewise with emotions and feelings and so forth. Any mental agitation, be aware of it and then conscientiously replace your mind back onto the breath. 
And it is likewise with a dull mind. If you find your mind becoming dull, slothful, sleepy, then focus more brightly on your breath. This way, refocusing on your breath is the antidote for both the agitated and worried mind as well as the dull mind. And so now we will practice like this for a few minutes in silence. Don't put pressure on yourself. The more you do this, the more you practice this, the more natural it becomes. So now you can feel very pleased with yourself for engaging in this short meditation. Generally, I, I'd like to say that, um, you know, we should meditate at least once a day, even if it begins off very short like that, or, you know, maybe 20 minutes or more, up to you. 
Uh, often people say the morning time is the best time for meditation. And, um, but also the evening, I think, is very important too before you go to sleep. As we spoke about last week, the changeable mental factor of sleep is affected um, by the moments before sleep. So actually meditation before sleep not only uh, helps you to release any tensions or any stresses you have from the day, also it helps to check your mind. And you can ask yourself what, it, what you have done, what has been your intentions throughout the day. And then you can help to purify any negativities you may have created and also encourage yourself to um, focus more and uh, nurture and increase your good qualities. And now extend this love and kindness to yourself. Fill yourself with love and kindness, friendship, acceptance, respect, appreciation. So much so that now you overflow with love and kindness, like a tidal wave of love and kindness. It now you you can radiate it outwards to your family and friends. And also to strangers. And even those you find difficult. Have the wish that all of these people have happiness and its causes and are free from suffering and its causes, and that are at peace with themselves and all that surrounds them. Extend this loving kindness out further and further to all other living beings around your area. Those that fly through the air, those that live on the land and under the land and in the waters those born from wombs, from eggs, by moisture and through transformation. May they all be happy and free from suffering. And now extend this loving kindness out further and further to include your whole state or county. And other states and counties throughout your whole country and other countries, firstly ones that you are familiar with and those you are not familiar with as well. Have this loving kindness pervade the whole planet and may all of the living beings on this planet, the innumerable living beings, may they be happy and free from suffering. Now extend this love and kindness out through all, throughout the whole solar system and other solar systems within this Milky Way galaxy and other galaxies throughout this universe and other universes throughout infinite space. May this immeasurable love and kindness pervade throughout infinite space unlimited, unimpeded. Now be present here and now, and we will recite the dedication prayer. Due to this merit, may I soon attain the enlightened state of the Buddha, so that I may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their sufferings. May the precious bodhicitta, not yet born, rise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And may the precious view of shunyata, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. So we will continue and definitely finish the 51 derivative mental factors today. Um, I was planning on finishing last week, but you know, Plans don't always come to fruition in the time you want them to. So um, I remember one time 
the Dalai Lama was asked, uh, it was at one of his teachings years ago, maybe I don't know, 25 years ago. And uh, he was asked, are you finished yet, Your Holiness? And he says, what? We are never finished. Even when we become Buddha, when we are enlightened, we still must benefit living beings. The only difference really, I, uh, one of the big differences when you are enlightened is that it's spontaneous. There's no effort. It's just natural. Whereas uh, us human beings here, we have to try a bit. You know, we have to be a little bit more forceful in um, nurturing and working to perfect our good qualities. Uh, at the same time, decreasing our faults. You know, what to pick up, what to put down. And we have to constantly remind ourselves we, we, we must do, do this, pick up the good qualities, increase them, so forth, and put down and eventually eradicate the faults. Because the faults are what is obscuring our enlightened nature, our Buddha nature. Interesting, isn't it? It's like we already have it. It's not like we're going out um, to get it from outside. That's like the quote of mine, there is in light, which is really taken from, from teachers over the years and the Buddha as well, um, and then put into my own words. But it's, uh, there is enlightenment, but no enlightenment is there. So another way to look at that with explanation with my finger is there is enlightenment, but no enlightenment is there. Like, a, like the horizon. If um, you're looking at the horizon wherever you're at and you think, I want to go to that horizon. So then you start to make your way to the horizon. When you get to what you think is the horizon, you look back, where's the horizon now? It's where you were. So the enlightenment actually is inside, inner, not outside. Don't search for it in the supermarket. But also don't not search for it in the supermarket if you're in the supermarket. I think, I think you know what I mean, even though I'm being a little bit cryptic. So anyway, um, we'll finish off the um, these four changeable uh, derivative mental factors. Of course, we spoke about sleep in, in quite, quite in depth last week. And then we spend a little bit of time on regret or remorse. And um, then a little bit of time on investigation. But we didn't touch analysis. So today, the first thing um, I did get asked a question about uh, regret or remorse. And the, the question was asked in the sense that uh, how can you how can it be positive or negative? In, the, in how can it be? How could you regret engaging in good actions, for instance? Um, and the example that I gave was: um, imagine that uh, you're walking down the street and it's cold, and you walk past somebody who doesn't have a, a house as a home. They're living on the streets, and you see that they're cold, and you, you're wearing your favorite jacket. You're really attached to this jacket, and it's a really good jacket. And you decide through this spontaneous feeling of compassion and empathy and kindness to give your jacket, your favorite jacket to this homeless person to help keep them warm and dry. And then you go home and you think about your action. And rather than rejoicing in, oh, I was really kind and generous. I'm really happy with myself for that. And I should do that more and more and more. I wish others can do that. Rather than thinking that, you think, oh, no, I've given away my best jacket. I wish I didn't do that. You know, so um, I th that, that's, that's how regret can, um, like a positive regret can turn negative very quickly. Okay, so maybe that's, a, I think it's an obvious example. It's very subtle as well. Um, so, you know, if we are regretting engaging in negative actions, this is very, very good as long as it comes along with the resolve to try, try our best not to engage in, in these negative actions again. But also we can have regret for positive actions and then this decreases uh, the benefit and uh, decreases the good karma if you want. So now that's that one dealt with. Uh, then also just to reiterate the um, investigation, um, like as we spoke about uh, briefly last week, investigation, and analysis very closely related, but investigation is more like a gross discernment, a gross, um, what's the word I used, a conceptualization. And so we're having kind of a look at something, whatever it may be, 
the, whatever object it is that we are, um, or even subject our own mind, that we are anal, uh, investigating to find out um, more clearly and more detail of what it actually is or isn't. Uh, this is like the gross aspect of it. It's kind of like um, the example I used last week uh, was that, uh, let's say for instance, the atom, we're, we're looking to understand the atom. Um, and uh, so we can maybe look through microscopes or even just through inferential knowledge, through teachings, scientific teachings, and also teachings of the Buddha and so forth. Um, we, we're able to then look at it and go, oh, okay, each atom is changing all the time. Yes, this is, you know, we're, we're kind of getting an idea of this. But analysis is when you get into the finer details to really work it out. So invest, you have to investigate before you can analyze. And so you investigate something, um, the, the true nature of something, or investigate how to deal with something or how to do something, how to implement something. You may have a plan to build um, a house. Um, then you have to investigate how to go about doing this. And then, of course, um, if you are really, really engaged in the building of the house yourself, with the help of some others, then you have to analyze the finer details of how to actually do this. Um, another example of, of the difference is if you are, let's say we're editing a book or proofreading a book, it's probably better. And you, you've already proofread it a bit, you've edited it a little bit, but now you need to proofread it just to see um, if all of the paragraphs are in the right place, um, if you know the obvious things that are glaring at you, um, that they are right and correct. Then the analyzing is more kind of like the punctuation and the, the grammar and the actual words you're using and all those tiny little finer details um, is, is the analyzing. Now in the investigation um, can be very helpful um, to develop the right view or the correct view, the correct understanding of how things are and also help us to decrease eventually eradicate any wrong views that we may have. For instance, the right view is uh, it, with conditioned phenomena uh, is that it's all impermanent, constantly changing. Um, it has the nature of being unsatisfactory due to this and other factors. And also there's no substantial self um, from its own side anywhere to be found. In other words, the, what we call the three marks of existence, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and no self. We can work our way to understand this. But when we, so often we live uh, opposite to that. We perceive or we live by, even though we may even know that things are always changing, things are always impermanent, but we live in a way that they are permanent. And then what happens is we get upset about it. Let's say, for instance, you get a new car. This happened with a friend of mine a few years ago, got a new car and then it gets a scratch. Then, then you get upset about it because you're living in a way that you think things are permanent. And you also think that it's yours. Having that car is my car. How dare somebody scratch it, you know? And then the mind is not conducive to having a very clear mind. The mind becomes very, very turbulent. It becomes saha. Um, the Buddha called this planet, by the way, Sahaloka, which means turbulent world. But within this turbulent world, of course, we can find peace of mind. We can have the right view of how things are and even go beyond that to develop and realize the supreme wisdom. And this investigation and this analysis help us to be able to do so. So I think that's enough for that one. And then... Uh, Analysis. I actually forget uh, what I wrote for my notes to tell you. So excuse me while I read them. Um, yeah, so it's more subtle discernment or subtle conceptualization than investigation is. Uh, more precise analysis of an object and distinct where you can distinguish specific details and more importantly, the meaning behind the details. So the meaning behind the words or phrases. For instance, if you're, if you're looking into the Dharma teachings, especially the definitive teachings, uh, the definitive teachings on how things really are, not interpretable teachings now as such. 
uh, just to uh, reiterate on that, just or clarify on that, the, you can split up the Buddhist teachings into definitive teachings and also interpretable teachings. Uh, interpretable in the sense of who you were speaking to, what was this, the conditions, what was the circumstance, what was the questions asked, and so forth. Whereas there are definitive teachings of this is the way things really are as well. So if we are contemplating these definitive teachings um, by investigating and then analyzing, we enable ourselves to be able to really break through and understand. And we're, the word the Buddha used a lot, of course, this is the English word, but it's to penetrate, penetrate beyond what we think is impenetrable, to penetrate beyond ordinary understanding. Um, an example, I, oh, I already gave you the example about proofreading a book. And so um, we were able to develop more of a clear um, mind, a clear understanding of how things really are. And the more clear our analysis is, the greater our discernment is, the more effectively we can change and improve our view towards being the right view. And the more clearly we will perceive things accurately. It leads to more to correct motivation and actions as well. I think that's enough for that. But um, it's really important, you know, the correct motivation. Remember that uh, you can say motivation or will, this is the fourth of the aggregates out of the five aggregates or skandhas. This is where karma is created in our intentions, in our motivations, behind our thoughts, actions and words. So it's really important to do the best we can. Always, always check our mind, often check our mind to see our intention. What is our intention? Um, because on occasions, because we've lived so many lives um, of not knowing or not understanding reality and our minds even, then uh, we may fool ourselves sometimes thinking that we are um, engaging in our actions and words and our thoughts based on pure intentions when we may not be. So it's really important to often check our mind. It can be very subtle. And the only way you can do that is sit quietly and really don't speak, um, don't engage in physical actions around you and really just think about it. What is my intention right now? I remember many years ago, one of my uh, teachers in the Tibetan tradition, uh, Kyabje Lama Lati Rinpoche, or, or commonly known as Lati Rinpoche. And, uh, you know, he said to me, how's your practice? And I said, it seems to be going well. Um, there's a few, few issues. Uh, I still get irritated when people treat others badly and so forth, you know. He said, there's two problems. He says, your intention is not pure. You need to check your intention. You need to, most of the time you have good intention, but sometimes you fall back into old habits, even from previous lifetimes. So we should always try to um, correct our intentions. This will help us to uh, develop more and more clearly the right view and right understanding of how things are from the point of view of ourselves, as well as others and other phenomena as well, everything that surrounds us. And he also said that we always, right up until enlightenment, we really, we need to take refuge. Refuge in the Buddha, the teacher, the Dharma, the teaching, and the Sangha. Sangha being the, what we call the fourfold Sangha of um, ordained males, ordained females, and the lay practitioners, females and males as well. So um, there's a bit of a misunderstanding over, I don't know when this started to happen, but people look at, Sangha, they think it's only monks and nuns, but it's not. It's everybody who practices the Dharma because the word Sangha means harmonious and supportive community. This is a community of practitioners that help us. You know, to, for us to practice by ourselves is, is very, very few people will be able to do that. We, we need to have the support of the Dharma friends around us, the teachers, um, but also the Dharma practitioners. And even those, those ones maybe are not uh, practicing that well because they first of all teach us what not to do, uh, but secondly, test our patience and, and so forth and uh, give us the opportunity to, to say to them, actually, you're practicing incorrectly. You need to check your intentions, motivations, and this is how you do it. You know, it gives us the opportunity to be kind and to share whatever limited um, knowledge of the Dharma um, or wisdom and compassion that we have 
we need to share with others. So everybody in within this supportive and harmonious community um, is known as Sangha. So that's the third of the jewels. But of course, we have ordained Sangha as well, um, and also, also other teachers as well. Okay, so it's important to, to um, respect each other and learn from each other and help each other. So these three uh, refuges, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, are very important for us to take refuge in these uh, consistently. Um, I think a lot of Buddhist practitioners that have been practicing for a very long time um, think this is the basis and don't think about it too much. But actually, there is the basis, like I've said before, like the foundation of a house. What happens if you have bad foundation in your house? How long do the walls stand up? How long does the ceiling stay on top of the walls? The foundation is the most important part of the house, actually. So our refuge is one of the most, or it could, you could say the, the most important part of our practice. Because actually, the more you, um, you practice the Dharma, the more that you... Uh, improve the more you understand and your more correct your practices the more uh, this refuge becomes quite deep uh, because we're actually taking refuge in our own enlightened nature and also in the fact that all living beings have this enlightened nature so it's not only that we're taking refuge in the buddha or other buddhas or the Buddha's teachings in writing and then the contemplation and then the um, absorbing our mind with these teachings by practicing them as well. It's not only about that, it's also within ourselves. As I said before, there is enlightenment, but no enlightenment is there. Now, I have just realized we're under one minute. So um, I'll see you next week. Um, just whatever you take from today's class, uh, please utilize it well. Um, whatever you don't take from the class, don't worry about it. Just leave it be. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me one way or another. Maintain pure motivation, pure intentions. <laughs>